Hello and welcome to another episode of Wiggy Reviews. Today I will be reviewing The Weird Sisters by Eleanor Brown. Alright, so The Weird Sisters by Eleanor Brown is a pretty simple book. Um, I don't really know how to describe what it is, so I'm just gonna read the back for you instead of me trying to stumble along and sound like an idiot. Alright, so, three sisters have returned to their childhood home, reuniting the eccentric Andreas family. Here, books are a passion. There is no problem a library card can't solve, and TV is something other people watch. Their father, a professor of Shakespeare who speaks almost exclusively in verse, named them after the bard's heroines. It's a lot to live up to. The sisters each have a hard time communicating with their parents and their lovers, but especially with one another. What can the shy homebody eldest sister, the fast-living middle child, and the bohemian youngest sibling have in common? Only that none has found life to be what was expected, and now faced with their parents' frailty and their own personal disappointments, not even a book can solve what ails them. So you can already kind of tell this is basically a story about family and three sisters and their relationships with each other and them... I guess intera their interactions with each other as they go through these hardships that have each befallen them. So I guess I should introduce the characters first, uh, since they are kind of the main focus of the book. Uh, there is the oldest, uh, the oldest daughter, Rosalind, who goes by Rose in the book. Uh, the second eldest, our middle child, Beatrice, who goes by Bean, and the youngest, Cordelia, who goes by Cordy. Uh, there's also the father and the mother who are a big important part of the are important to the story and they do play key roles in a lot of it um, But just kind of as like something that Kind of starts the story so the sisters come home once they find out that their mother has cancer uh, The first one to arrive is Rose who already was already living in the town with her with her parents uh, and she decides to move in to help her mother go through you know the cancer treatments and all of that. The next one to arrive back home is Bean. Uh, her her motivation to go back home though wasn't necessarily that her mother had cancer. It was the fact that she had been stealing money from the company that she be she'd been working for in New York. So they, you know, kind of called her out like, "Hey." We have some abnormalities, and she's like, nope, they're not abnormalities, I was stealing from you. And I'm like, well, you owe us this money, we're not gonna press charges, just get us the money back. So she runs away back home to try to figure out her life, how she's gonna pay this large sum of money. And then Cordy, her, the conflict that brings her home is the fact that she has found out that she is pregnant. And she doesn't know what to do because she <laughs> she's the baby of the family and she acts like the baby of the family her whole life. When she was old enough, she left uh, left their hometown and they she went off and she became kind of a a hippie hobo. <laughs> she goes around just kind of crashing on couches and just being a free spirit. But once she finds out she's pregnant, she has to go home because she doesn't know what to do because she's the baby. She didn't she's never had to deal with these problems herself. Um, so that's kind of the backstory of the sisters and why they all came home at the same time. Uh, I guess also for Rose, I forgot to mention that she is engaged and getting married, but her fiancé is off in London because he got a kind of a job over there and she's a little mad because she doesn't want to leave. She does. She's never left her hometown except for like vacations, but she doesn't really want to leave and go live somewhere else. Uh, so that conflict with her is, is leaving instead of the other two coming back and staying. Um, and that's kind of the backstory of it, and getting into it, that's what you should be expecting to see, and kind of getting into those, how they're going to handle these, each of their own problems, and how they're going to tell their family, and how they're going to discover new things about themselves because of these things. Um, let's see. Uh, now let's get into a little more of the techni technicals of the story. Uh, Eleanor Brown did something very interesting, which I've not come across very frequently, or maybe not even at all. I don't think I've ever read a book written in this way. Uh, she chose as an author to write in the first person plural. Now if you don't know what that is, that's okay, I had no idea what it was either. Uh, but basically the story is told from the perspective of all three of the sisters, so there's a lot of we knew, we remember this, we, 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 we. But what makes it such an interesting style of writing is that even though it's from the perspective of all three and there's a lot of we and us and that kind of thing, it's never told from the sisters as in I said 
I said it's always Rose said, but we understood what she meant. Or Cordy was imagining this, 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 and we could only, we could only imagine what she was thinking. You know, it's a very interesting, it's an interesting style that not a lot of authors do, partly because it's a very difficult style to write in effectively. That being said, I believe that Eleanor Brown did it very effectively. Like, I, once you finish the book, you're like thinking, there's no other way she could have written this book, really. It actually fits perfectly with the themes and the things she was trying to hit in the story. So I think it was a very good choice for her to write it in that way, and it's such a unique and rare just writing that writing style that people can do effectively um so that was a big big concern for me at first but it really actually it helped bring out the whole themes of family and the fact that you know even no matter what you do your family will always be there to you know to support you um and now to the part that a lot of people i i think get a little turned off i don't know i wouldn't say turned off actually uh but i I think something that scares people is whenever they hear something about Shakespeare, people tend to freak out. It's kind of like post-traumatic stress syndrome from high school, I guess. A lot of people they remember in high school like, oh god, it's Shakespeare, oh my god, Romeo and Juliet, why are we studying something that's written in a dead language? Now I will preface this part of the review by saying I am a Shakespeare nerd. <laughs> I love Shakespeare. It did take me until college to actually start appreciating Shakespeare, but I love Shakespeare. I have seen many Shakespeare plays. I've read almost every single uh, play by him. Uh, I have movies <laughs> of play performances as well as film adaptations. So I am a Shakespeare nerd, so this could be completely biased, but I'm going to try to avoid geeking out at you a couple times, but I cannot make any promises. So, as I said, as was mentioned in the, you know, the summary of the book on the back, uh, the sisters were all raised by a professor of Shakespeare who speaks almost exclusively in Shakespearean lines, uh, because he's a professor. He's a professor at the college that is, and he's the Shakespeare professor. That's what everybody knows him as, and that's what he all, like, his big passion and his his area of expertise is Shakespeare. So of course Eleanor Brown had to include Shakespeare quotations throughout the book and they were integrated very well, um, especially for people who don't like Shakespeare. I think she chose particularly, particularly, I think she chose lines that were very easy, I guess, for people who are not as familiar with Shakespeare or who whenever they see Shakespeare kind of lose their mind and blank out. Um, like, uh, well, I could actually bring up an example for you. I mean, I could flip to any page, really. Uh, almost any page. Um, and a, a good example would be, let's see, uh, when Cordy tells her, talks about, talk, is, is speaking to her father about the baby. And of course, he's very mad because she doesn't know who the father is, and she is the baby. She, he thinks she doesn't understand how much, uh, raising a baby takes and all that. And, you know, there's a point where her father yells at him, which is very rare for Cordy for, the, for her father to yell at him. And he says, God damn it, why are you being so irresponsible? And she replies to him in the only way she knows how from the way she was raised by saying, Why speaks my father so ungently? Which is a line from The Tempest uh, when Prospero yells at his daughter Miranda. Um, now that's the nerdy part of me knowing that. Sorry, but she does mention she, she does mention Miranda in the paragraph. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so she integrates it very well. I mean, even if you don't know Shakespeare, why speaks my father so ungently? Obviously, he's saying, why are you yelling at me? Why are you being so cruel? Like, ugh, it's pretty clear. Um, so I think it was a good choice to include as many lines as she does in the book. She includes about 90, 90 lines of Shakespeare text uh, in throughout the entirety of the book. Yes, I did count. Yes, I'm a nerd like that. But if I didn't know the number, you'd be mad. Because um, <laughs> I know how this works. Uh, but, uh, so, yay that Shakespeare is being integrated into modern language because the, the important thing to know about Shakespeare is that it wasn't written for educated people. It wasn't written for scholars. Yes, there is scholarly things in it. Yes, he did use some of it to mock 
the current <laughs> heads of state and all that. But the main thing, the main people that Shakespeare wrote his works for were for the poor, were for the common man. And so he uses the language that they would understand. Um, and I'm not going to go any further into that or else I'm going to start spouting what I learned about Shakespeare and probably bore you to tears. So it's good that she integrates the modern with the past. And it works pretty well. I mean, there's a couple in there that if you know the plays very well and you know the lines very well, you'll be like, yes, that works out of context. But in the context of the actual scene that it's from, that doesn't actually match up perfectly. But like I, but you know, this is a this is a fiction book written for everyone, so that doesn't really take away from anything unless you're a crazy person like me. Um, I I'm speaking a lot of positives about that, but I think. A negative for me is just kind of a typical negative that comes from books like this that are trying to make you feel good or make you feel better about your own life and all that is that a lot of the conflicts in here, besides the main conflicts, those do take time, but a lot of them kind of are cleaned up quickly. Um, like Bean's, I guess the, Bean is really the only one that kind of ticks me off a little bit. It's like, you know, she, she embezzled all this money from the company and they say, we're not going to arrest you, we just want you to leave. And I know I know some some companies would do that, but it's like, I, I kind of feel like, oh, there should have been a little more of a tense tension there, you know? Um, like, maybe even a threat like, we're not going to call the police now, but if you don't pay us within a certain amount of time, then we will call the police. You know, just a little more, a little more dig in there to make it a little more, uh, not kind of like, you, we understand, and da -da, we like you, and da-da-da-da. I mean, maybe I'm overlooking, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but there's also a couple other examples in it that I don't want to get into because they kind of play off of other things. And, but overall, these stories and the interactions of the characters with each other, including the side characters that you meet throughout the book, um, they, they're very, they're very nice, they're, they're realistic. The dialogue isn't too cheesy, it's very much, um, Especially the sisters when they're interacting together. It's absolutely how siblings interact and it's brilliant. It's, I think she captured that very well. Um, especially the parts where they can be fighting one minute and then the next they're trying on clothes together. <laughs> you know, it's that crazy thing that siblings do when they're mad at each other. You're like, you're mad at each other, but you still love each other. But you, God, you just want to rip your heads off. But, uh, but we're family. You know, it's that kind of thing that really, that was really good to read and she captured it so well. And I, I believe she was a sibling uh, with from a large family as well. Yeah, the youngest of three sisters, so of course she would know those kind of interactions. Um, and then there was one really powerful thing in it that I, I have to share with you because it, it completely pff, caught me off guard, but it's something that I think is very good, especially if you are a, a young adult going out on your own, becoming a becoming a true adult, you know? And uh, maybe just, an, maybe you still are feeling it as an adult. I don't know, it just kind of hit me a little hard, uh, so I, wanna, I just want to mention it, and it's just, I'm just going to read the first line, the first two, the first line from this that really, like, kind of tugged at my heart and really hit home for me and made me really love this book. Um, and it's just a question, it's a question, just a simple question, and it, that's usually how it is, you know, something, a simple question that really is like, huh, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, so the question is, how old were you when you first realized your parents were human? And that really plays in this book. I mean, I know she's talking about, you know, her, the family, she's, ta they're talking about the sisters when they really start to realize, like, holy crap, we're adults. Holy crap, our parents can help us through this. Like, I actually have to be the adult in this situation, and I have to fix this myself. I can't ask for their help. And also, yes, their mother is, has cancer, and that's another aspect of it, but this, this sentence kind of comes from, from the father, too. Like, they start realizing, like, oh my god, even dad's not gonna be here for much longer. I mean, he, you know, it's it's such a powerful question that a lot of people don't think about until they reach a certain age, and then they're suddenly like, holy crap. Or like when something in your life happens where you realize, crap, my parents aren't gonna be here for the rest of my life. I, they won't always be there to help me. Like, I gotta figure this shit out on my own. You know? So it's, it was a very powerful question and I just loved it. Like, that was kind of the nail in the coffin for me. I was like, oh god, I love this book! Um, but again, like, some of those things got a little... And then also there were a couple flashbacks from the childhoods that didn't really fit with what they were talking about in the chapters that they were included. Um, there weren't too many, uh, but and like, there were a couple that I was kind of like, I don't understand why this is 
here. I don't know what this has to do with what just happened or what is maybe has something to do with what's going to happen. I don't know. But there weren't too many of those, so I can, can I can forgive it for that. And then the ones that worked, like the flashbacks that worked and really helped to push the story forward, they were they were perfect. They were brilliant because it's like whenever you have something like that, you remember back to a time when something similar happened, but it wasn't as it's not as similar when you think when it's happening because you are thinking of it through the child's eyes. With all of that said, like, beautiful use of the first person plural, which is a very hard style of writing to get into, uh, and I know it probably, and I'm saying this from a perspective of someone who enjoyed the style, I know a lot of people don't enjoy those kinds of things, they don't enjoy the weird styles that aren't used a lot, um, so I know a lot of people probably didn't won't like this book because of that. But if you want to try something that you haven't really seen a lot of or seen before in books, like I say check this out just for the writing style, even if you don't like the story. Um, Story-wise, the, the ties to family and the ties of growing up and realizing uh, that you're not infallible and, and your parents aren't infallible, that you know everyone's human and you all make mistakes and sometimes you have to solve them on your own, but sometimes you also need to be able to reach out to other people. Uh, Rose is in particular, she has trouble reaching out for help. She's always been the big sister, always been there to clean everybody else up. And then she finally has something where she needs people's help. Um, so she learns that she has to ask for help, and it's hard for her, but she does eventually do it. And then Cordy has to grow up quickly, and she realizes she can't be the baby anymore. She can still be the baby, but she's not in everything. And then Bean just kind of realizes that, you know, she may have been doing all this stuff for attention. Uh, and then her taking the money and all that was just kind of a cry for help for her to be like, I don't know who I am, but I feel better when I do these things. Um, so the story is great with the sisters and their problems and then they're coming together as a family and realizing that they can change and they can go back to being who they were, like these different themes of just like coming together and yet moving apart is is good and it was interesting and it was very realistic and it's kind of like you feel like you're part of the family with how well they are described and how well they communicate with each other and communicate with us as the audience. So you kind of feel like you're part of the family which is great. Um, the integration of Shakespeare's words with modern language was, in my opinion, done very well. Now, I mean, I wouldn't say perfect, like, I don't think we could all just go out and start doing it, but I think it really was nice to see it, because I think it helps people understand, like, Shakespeare isn't scary. It's not scary, it's English. It's not a weird language. It's English, and he says what he means. He's, his words, they say what they say. Like, you should be able, if you read them out loud, and if you read them out loud and you really listen to the words, it makes sense. That's all the nerding out I'll do for that. I know a lot of people would disagree with me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? Uh, I guess I just get right to the score then. Uh, for me, the overall score for this is a nine out of 10. Uh, the things that didn't work, weren't too distracting to really take me out of the story. They just kind of were like, okay. Uh, but they weren't too bad and they weren't too many. Like overall, the story was great. I loved it. I, and I'm not someone who really likes these kind of family stories, but what drew me was the Shakespeare. So the Shakespeare brought me in, especially the title of the book, which is The Weird Sisters. And if you don't know, The Weird Sisters is another name for the witches from the play Macbeth. Yes, I said Macbeth. Yes, I know there's a superstition behind it, but the superstition is actually you can't say Macbeth unless you are when you're in a theater when you are performing it. Ha! <laughs> Anyways, so that drew me in also because Macbeth is one of my favorite plays. Uh, it's one of I had I've had the privilege to work on it twice in my life, and it's one of my absolute favorite shows. Uh, has some of the best words in it. Um, so of course, when I saw the title was Weird Sisters, I absolutely had to read it. And of course, they make references to the Weird Sisters in it, obviously, because, you know, being three daughters raised by a Shakespeare professor, they of course had to do the scene from Macbeth where the, th where the Weird Sisters are doing their, you know, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Anyways. <laughs> so yeah, Shakespeare, absolutely, when I saw that, I had to read it. So yeah. Weird Sister, The Weird Sisters by Eleanor Brown. Check it out if you want to try something a little written a little differently than what you're used to. And also if you're curious as to how well she integrated Shakespeare into modern language, check it out. Uh, once again, my score is 9 out of 10, and I guess I'll see you next time on Wiggy Reviews.
Bye.